Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC3 at QuickSurf Internet Studios. Linux Newslog is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at uh, quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you haven't already done so. For those of you who have, thank you so much for subscribing. And with that, let's get into the stories for this episode. Starting off over at PC World, Black Energy Cyber Espionage Group targets Linux systems and Cisco routers. This is a report of some uh, bad stuff that's been going on recently. A cyber espionage group that has built its operations around a malware program called Black Energy has been compromising routers and Linux systems based on ARM and MIPS architectures in addition to Windows computers. Security researchers from antivirus vendor Kapersky Lab released a report Monday detailing some of the custom modules that the group has developed for Black Energy, a tool originally created and used by cyber criminals to launch distributed denial of service attacks. Variants of the Black Energy plugins developed by the Cyber Espionage Group were discovered for both Windows and Linux systems. They enhanced the malware program with capabilities like port scanning, password stealing, system information gathering, digital certificate theft, remote desktop connectivity, and even hard disk wiping. So this is bad, bad stuff. Um, there's some seriously bad stuff going on here. Um, if you have a Linux-based system that uh, uh, runs on, you know, various, well, if you have any Linux-based system that's based on an ARM processor and or uh, Cisco routers or that sort of thing, this is definitely something you want to be looking into to make sure that you are not infected. They've largely been targeting the energy sector, so uh, bad stuff for sure. From InfoWorld Tech Watch, Fedora 21 rolls three versions of Linux into one OS. Following hints earlier this year, a beta of Red Hat Fedora Linux 21 has finally arrived in three incarnations. Three incarnations. Cloud, server, and workstation. Fedora 21 also provides the first public glimpse of Project Atomic, Red Hat's initiative to produce a Linux distribution optimized as a Docker container host. Users who have deployed Fedora in the past as a workstation environment can turn to the appropriately named Fedora 21 workstation. In addition to updates of all previously included software, the new version features a technology preview of the Wayland display server, uh, an improvement on the x.org display server currently used by Linux distributions. Workstation also includes the Dev Assistant tool to provide developers with a fast way to instantiate project environments. So pretty cool. Definitely check it out uh, if you are a Fedora user. Or really a Red Hat user because this allows you to do neat things uh, in kind of a test-ish type environment. From Linux Gizmos, a tiny $269 3D resin printer runs Linux on Raspberry Pi. This is kind of cool. It's called the iBox Nano. It's billed as the world's smallest, cheapest 3D resin printer. It offers Wi-Fi and 328 micron resolution and runs Linux on a Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi has been used as a computer interface device for 3D printers as well as a calibration add-on. But as far as we know, the iBox Nano is the first 3D printer in which Linux is running the show internally. Last month, an engineer student named Owen Jeffries showed a video of a Raspberry Pi-based 3D printer project, but the project has yet to be completed. Uh, There's links to that uh, near the bottom of uh, this particular article, which is linked up in the show notes. Uh, Meanwhile, the only other commercial 3D printers we know of that run Linux are the three MakerBot replicator models announced earlier this year. So pretty interesting. Definitely check it out, especially if you're uh, looking for something uh, small and Portable. Also, from Linux Gizmos, a uh, hackable drone controller runs Linux. Gi- um, Gizmo for you has gone to Indiegogo to ask for a s- 
ask for $600 for a modular Linux-based open source remote control for UAVs and other remote controlled craft. Three years in the making, the open source remote control device is available in Indiegogo fixed funding packages starting at 350 euros for the basic version or 1250 euros for an advanced version. The Linux-based OSRC device is designed to act as a hackable universal controller for all types of drones, drones filming UAV control and general RC. It seems to be primarily aimed at high-end hobbyist remote model airplanes. Still pretty cool nonetheless. I mean, you have to admit, this is uh, definitely uh, something that uh, you want to be uh, playing around with, especially if you are into remote controlling things and doing camera stuff and that sort of thing. So pretty neat. From thevarguy.com, is an Intel tablet with Ubuntu Linux OS in the works? I don't know. Let's find out. Almost uh, lately, almost all of the headlines about Ubuntu Linux and Canonical have been involved, uh, have involved the cloud. But open source fans dreaming of an Ubuntu-powered Intel x86 tablet may have reason for excitement. If reports are accurate, that the UT1 Linux tablet will ship by this December. Veronix reported news to this effect a few days ago, citing information from Andrew Bernstein, who has a history of involvement in Linux and open source development. Details on this tablet are sparse, but hardware specifications for the mobile device include an Intel Atom Z3735D system on a chip, a quad-core processor, 2 gigs of RAM, and 16 gigabytes of storage, which incidentally makes it pretty similar to the Dell Latitude 2100 netbook um, that the author of the article here bought a few years ago and is still happily chuggling along on Ubuntu Linux today. It's not entirely clear who's launching the tablet, but uh, companies named Dembski Group and Mastermind Hardware and Logistics have been uh, mentioned. Um, Bernstein is apparently part of that venture as well. Canonical almost certainly is not, so this is this will be something where they're taking uh, some what appears to be relatively off-the-shelf hardware and uh, just doing some uh, integration work to get Ubuntu working on it with a touch interface. So should be pretty interesting. I'll be keeping an eye on it to see what comes of it. From InfoQ.com, Google Cloud adds support for Ubuntu Linux distribution. Google partnered with Canonical to bring official Ubuntu images to the Google Compute Engine. This is pretty cool, especially if you're a user of Google Compute. Uh, Google Compute Engine became generally available in December 2013. Since then, it added support for Core OS, Debian, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, SUSE, and Microsoft Windows Server. Though Debian and Ubuntu distributions are compatible, many developers prefer to work on Ubuntu. According to Canonical, Ubuntu powers 85% of Linux workloads running on public clouds. Ubuntu is a popular choice of Linux distribution on Amazon EC2, Microsoft Azure, and Hewlett Packard Cloud and Joyent. So pretty interesting. Uh, definitely check it out, especially if you're looking to do some stuff with Google. From itworld.com, SGI gives the military its first petaflop supercomputer that we know of. Pretty neat. The Department of Defense has picked SGI to build a new petaflop supercomputer due to be delivered by next spring as part of its high-performance computing modernization program. The new computer will enhance the compute capabilities of the Department of Defense Supercomputing Resource Center at the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center. Boy, talk about a mouthful of acronyms. Yes, our military <laughs> loves its acronyms. The HPCMP is meant to improve mission-critical research and drive innovation throughout the armed forces. With a theoretical peak performance of 4.6 petaflops of compute power, the ICE-X computer is the fastest non-classified supercomputer in the military. So why are we talking about this? Well, uh, partially because SGI is planning to uh, deliver this uh, package with Linux at its core um, should be pretty interesting to see. They're expecting it to uh, to to basically debut in the top ten, uh, potentially number six uh, in the top five hundred supercomputer list. Um, 
The cool thing is it's it's getting most of this power on pure P CPU power. Um, the system will come with 12 petabytes of storage through an SGI Infinite infinite storage 5600 based NetApp E-Series technology running Intel Enterprise Edition for Luster. The servers will run SUSE Linux Enterprise Server 11 and custom SGI clustering software. So pretty interesting. Definitely uh, give this a read, especially if you follow supercomputing, uh, which I do kind of as a hobby. It's an interest of mine, high performance computing. So anyway, that will do it for this edition of Linux News Log. As everything, as always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes, which you can find online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you haven't already done so. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. I'll see you then. Bye.